Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, it's been a bit of a historic day. We've had a, a first vaccination, and uh, now this is my first uh, attempt at uh, <clears throat> putting on the Library Insights online. So just to give you a little bit of an introduction to that, we normally are doing this in the Welcome Library viewing room, uh, but you're joining me today uh, live from my boudoir in uh, the heart of Kent uh, here. <laughs> um, Fingers crossed everything's going to be smooth, but do bear with us if we have any technical problems. But thank you for joining us today. Uh, I am a, a white male with dark hair, uh, wearing glasses, and I'm also wearing a red checked shirt. My name is uh, Danny Reese, and I am the engagement officer for the Welcome Library here at Welcome Collection. And it is my absolute pleasure to have um, a returning guest speaker um, today. Before I introduce uh, her, I'm just going to say a little bit about the format, how we're going to work today. And uh, then you can sit back, uh, relax and enjoy. Uh, please feel free to uh, come to us with any questions. If you just want to sit back and enjoy it, that's absolutely fine. We do have a Slido available um, for questions or comments if you just want to uh, give us some feedback as we go along. So um, the format tonight is we're going to have a uh, talk by uh, Jessica. Uh, she's going to include in that some wonderful um, archive footage and also recorded interviews. We are then going to have a live demonstration, uh, which gives us our title, Condoms in the Kitchen, and how pleased was I to come <laughs> and put that out there um, for uh, an evening talk. Um, I would like then um, to follow up with a few sort of questions um, and answer session with Jessica, and then we'll come to your questions and comments at the end. So I think that's uh, all I need to cover at the beginning. Um, I'd like to introduce now uh, Dr. Jessica Borge, who is the visiting fellow at the uh, School of Advanced Study at the University of London. She has um, visited our archives. I know I've had the pleasure, Jess, of uh, getting out some uh, old um, material with a uh, Durex emblazoned uh, all over it um, for you. So Jess, thank you and good evening. Well, hello, Danny. Thank you so much for joining me in my kitchen. I'm just going to describe myself, if that helps. Um, so I'm, a, I'm on the right side of 40, just about. I'm a white half Maltese lady. Um, and I'm in, I would say, quite a 60s get up. Would you say that, Danny? And I'm sitting in my kitchen. So I'm presenting this from my kitchen today. So we're going to talk about the London Rubber Company. Um, and as Danny said, that is the company that made Durex condoms. Now we've got a lot to get through, so I think what we'll do is we'll start off with a, a very brief potted history of the company, um, and then we can move on to the other stuff. So if that sounds all right. Um, now we've got a few people backstage helping, so you'll hear me um, talking to Justin, who's being my very glamorous assistant tonight. Um, Justin, would you mind giving uh, us uh, image number one, please? So um, if you can all see image number one, what you should be looking at is um, an illustration of a chemist shop. And this was a chemist shop on Aldersgate Street. And this is the site of the London Rubber Company's first place of business. So in 1915, they started the business, uh, by which I mean the Jackson family. Um, they were a family of Jewish immigrants, a couple of generations in, um, who had a bit of experience in uh, sort of buying and selling chemists, um, uh, chemist stuff, so rubber goods, contraceptives, and also toys and candy and all, all manner of things. But this particular business um, was focused on supplying rubber goods to the pharmacy trade, uh, to surgical stores, uh, and also to herbalists and anyone else who was interested in selling contraceptives. Justin, could we have the next shot, please? So the next shot that you should be seeing is a, a pretty mundane frontage of a house which is in Hackney on Shore Road. Now this might not look like much, but behind this house in the 1930s 
there was a small industrial estate and that is where the London Rubber Company first started to make condoms. So up until this point, they had just been buying in other people's and, and supplying them for profit. But by 1932, they'd actually started making them. And Justin, if we could have the next photo, please. So hopefully now you'll be looking at um, a still image of a couple of pages from the 1936 London Rubber Company catalogue. So by the mid 1930s, they had started to sell their own products alongside the other stuff that they had been supplying wholesale. Um, and I don't know if you can see it, but um, you might be able to make out that on one of the pages here, a lot of the products are called Elarco, and that was a trade name that they used quite early on. Rather imaginatively, Elarco means Elarco, as in London Rubber Co. So <laughs> a great deal of thought went into that. Um, could we have the next slide, please, Justin? So the next slide should be another couple of pages from this catalogue. So this is very interesting for us and for what we're going to discuss today, because on one, one of these pages, um, you've got an advertisement for their own products, and it says for Elarco Protectives. Now, at the London Rubber Company, they didn't call condoms condoms. They were far too classy for that. And they had their own word, which was protectives. So if you worked at the London Rubber Company or you dealt with them, you would be discussing protectives rather than condoms. The other nice thing that um, we can see on this advert here um, is a very big statement in big type, which says that all of their condoms are tested by compressed air. Now, bearing in mind this is the mid 1930s, technology will move along a few decades later. Um, but at this point, this was the main method of testing. Um, and as a consumer, you would want to be quite reassured that some, some form of testing had gone into your product before you used it. Um, Justin, could we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So what you should be seeing now is a big Durex sign in the original Durex colours, which were yellow and purple. Um, maybe it's mauve, <laughs> I guess, somewhere in between. The important thing is that the Durex brand really started to take off towards the end of the 30s and the beginning of the 40s. So bearing in mind that the London Rubber Company had started as wholesalers in 1915, mm. by the 1930s they were making their own condoms. They had registered Durex as a trademark in 1928 before they started manufacturing, but it was really only during the war that it started to really take off. And the reason for this is that the London Rubber Company uh, were making condoms for British troops from about 1942. And that's really important because that captured a, a whole demographic of adult men who were becoming familiar with the Durex brand and, and were obviously associating it with uh, with condoms. Could we have the next image please, Justin? So the next image is a really lovely aerial shot of the main factory in Chingford, which was uh, taken by British Aero Films in 1951. Um, and this shows just how big the factory was at the beginning of the 1950s. So they'd started their manufacturing at a small place in Hackney in the 30s. By the end of the 30s, they had moved to this site that you're looking at now. They were producing under the Durex brand and other brands, but mainly for the war effort. And by the 1950s, they were so successful that they could really expand. Um, Justin, could we have the next slide, number seven, please? So this slide might not seem that interesting. It's really just the front of the factory but it marks a, a transition for the London Rubber Company. So here in this shot, they've kitted out their factory with a nice new 1960s facade. It's very modern. Um, and this was really the golden age for London Rubber, which is why I'm wearing my 1960s gear today. Um, a lot of popular history would have you believe that as soon as the pill came out, condom sales went down. And that just wasn't the case in Britain. Condoms were really, really strong. And very importantly for the London Rubber Company, um, they had an ace up their sleeve. And that's the next slide. If you could pop that up, please, Justin. That's number eight. So what you should be seeing now is a condom uh, that's been unrolled and that's been photographed next to a packet of old fashioned condoms and they look a bit old fashioned, but they were technically really advanced. What we're looking at is the first 
lubricated condom. This is called the Durex Gossamer. It was absolutely marvellous at the time. There was nothing around that, that was anything like it. So it was pre-lubricated, so you didn't have to sort that out for yourself. So that's obviously one step you didn't have to worry about at the crucial moment. Also, they're supplied in foiled envelopes, which I'll talk a bit more about later. But the most important thing is that these were the most expensive condoms that London Rubber sold. And they were the most popular. I mean, they were remarkably popular. Um, so I think that's enough of the images for now, Justin, if that's OK. So, Danny, I haven't showed you what I've got in my special platter just behind me now. But before we move on, I've got something very special to show you. Can you see that? That's lovely. I can see that. It is lovely. So what's under the Union flag? Shall we have a look? Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm waiting. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> So these are some choice items from my personal collection of London Rubber Company condoms. And what we've got at the top here, and I'm just going to pick this up very gingerly. Can you see that? Oh, wow. So this is a brown paper packet which says um, Durex Transparent British Throughout Latex Prophylactic. So this is one of the wartime condoms that helped London Rubber to make its fortune. So these are very rare. They're very rare, Danny. You can't have it. I'm sorry. It's mine. Now, next to that, we've got a 1950s version. So it's the same sort of thing. It's a paper envelope. Um, it's in, I would say, lavender, lavender and burgundy, very masculine colours. Um, but what's important here is that even into the 1950s, the condoms are still in paper envelopes. Now, I'm going to hold this up to the camera and you should be able to see that there's still one in there. It's it's a bit worse for wear. So I'm going to I'm going to leave it where it is. I think it should live in there. But the important one that we want to discuss today is the Durex Gossamer condom. So this is that first lubricated condom. And I have a special guest to tell you all about it. So, um, Justin, would you mind rolling our first video? Thank you very much. Hello, John. Hello, Jess. Hello. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? My start off was that um, uh, I was born out in the country, out here at Olga, and um, I had a a idyllic childhood. I went to Buckersfield County High School eventually, uh, which was a very good thing for me. And then a couple of years, national service seemed to follow on almost straight away. After I came out of, my, of the army, where I did rather well, that sort of opened up for me. And before very long, uh, I saw this opportunity to join London Rubber which was in November 1951. And I started there on the ground floor, as one does, in the sales office, just working as a clerk. I had the opportunity to go out on the road as a salesman for a couple of years, which I snapped at because at the time, I must admit, the attraction mainly was the company car, <laughs> which... Uh, really transformed anyone's life as soon as they got a company car in those days. You were selling Durex up and down the country. I had been in a privileged position that I was uh, able to carve for myself my own territory, really, which was out in the home counties, lovely part of the world, uh, covering Middlesex, Buckinghamshire, uh, uh, Berkshire and Oxfordshire. And that entailed basically calling on every chemist that was in the area uh, and all uh, hairdressers. There was one product in particular that you sold, um, and that was the Durex Gossamer. So this is, um, this is one of the 60s packets. This was the first lubricated condom, and it made quite an impact, didn't it? Can you tell us a little bit about why this product, the lubricated gossamer, was so important? Yeah. 
Well, it was it was so important. We made it important, I think, but it was important <laughs> for the consumer uh, because they, we perceived um, that there was a, a gap in the market, really, that, uh, from the point of view of a, a dry, dryness was always a bit of a problem when people, people's sexual relations with a, a large number of people. And, of course, for them, it was very male orientated in those days the cry was always for more sensitivity and the idea of the thing being lubricated uh it did give the idea that it was a more sensitive thing uh, and certainly that was what we promoted it as and that's certainly what it was accepted as um, for us the big incentive was that uh, it carried more profit, a lot more profit. It absolutely transformed uh, uh, London Rubber's turnover uh, to a huge degree. So it sold really well? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> once you, if you got it on the into the shops, if you could once persuade someone to give it a try, uh, and, and the two products were both available, uh, it would it would outsell the dry product, hands down. One thing I did want to ask you about before we went was the foiled envelopes. Can you tell us anything about those? Because these ones came in foil rather than paper. Yeah, well, the product had conventionally always been packed in a paper envelope, uh, the, the dry product, a pack of three, which had to be done manually. Was enormously expensive. The foil uh, was a completely automated process uh, whereby the, uh, the thing came along on a machine, uh, the, the condoms came along uh, on a belt and were automatically applied, didn't require any hands on it at all. Uh, some lubricant was injected at that point, which seeped all around the product and in, in the course of a few hours it was fully lubricated. But the foil pack was seen anyway as being more hygienic. Uh, it was a, a definitely an improvement. Thank you very much John. Before I go there's one more thing I want to ask you. How old are you? How old am I? Yeah. Uh, well it's, to put it this way, in a few weeks' time, if we get into the new year, I shall be 90. 90? Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Since no one would rely on such a device if it was known to tear or burst in use, one layer of latex is not considered enough. A second layer is inseparably bonded to the first to give double reliability and strength while still being extremely thin. The enormous popularity of the protective it's as popular as all other methods added together, no doubt owes much not only to its simplicity, but also to the reliance which can be placed upon it. Thanks to these finished products, all being individually inspected and then tested electronically on this automatic machine. Every one goes through the test and even the tiniest hole, a small weakness even, can be detected by the machine. The few imperfect products are then automatically segregated and thrown out. The perfect products, now guaranteed perfect, pass on and are taken off the machine for packing. Nowadays, before packing, the protectives are often impregnated with lubricant, a refinement which makes them considerably more satisfactory in use. Efficient, harmless.
harmless, thoroughly reliable, why then are other methods even considered? Well, bluntly put, some men and some women find the protective disturbing. And that's not going to lead to a happy marriage. So long as there are no objections, the modern protective, with or without spermicide, successfully meets the needs of most people and is used by more people than any other. Well, hello. Welcome to my dresser, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> hello. Um, it's beautiful, uh, Jessica. Um, I'm afraid I can't see you at the moment, but um, I know I've seen it before, your wonderful uh, uh, dresser. Um, are you going to tell us a bit um, about what you're going to do? Yeah, absolutely. So in my experience, these kind of talks can get a bit dry. And as we heard from John Harvey, dryness is a known problem. So we want to try and do something to liven things up uh, a little bit here. Um, but before we go on to that, I thought I might just point out something that's on the back of my dresser, which is my new book. I love the run London Fabric Company so much, I have written a book about them and it is available at all good bookshops. And former senior head archivist Leslie A. Hall from The Welcome has written the foreword and we're very pleased about that. So I just thought I'd drop that in there, Danny. Hope you don't mind. Thank you. Could I um could you pass over a copy, Jess? Oh yeah, do I have a look at it? Here you go. That would be great. Cheers. Oh, thank you. Um wow, that looks like an absolute corker. Beautiful. Um sensuous red cover as well there i think it's very festive and makes an excellent christmas present at just 22 pounds <laughs> 50. <laughs> anyway i think we'd better get on with our experiment don't you all right so i've got a letter here from the london rubber company it's it's quite big it printed out quite large like one of those big checks when you win a prize but this is an important letter. It's from 1946, and they're in the middle of a discussion about how long their products will last, because this, this has been a, a bone of contention for, for, for ages with condoms. Now, they say something here that I want to read out to you. They say, our products are guaranteed in store for three years, and they do, in fact, keep indefinitely. We have some specimens here which are 15 years old and still as good as the day they were made. Well, Danny, as good as the day they were made. What do you think about that? <laughs> uh, well, I know I know rubber is perishable, but, uh, you know, it's an incredible, uh, stretchy, wonderful, tactile material. I think we should find out how <laughs> just how wonderful it is. Shall we give it a shot? <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh, in my cocktail cupboard, cupboard here, look what I've got, Danny. Oh, what a treat. I can see you now, Jess. That's so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Look at that. Wow. So this is um, this is an original uh, show box of Durex Gossamer condoms. There's your pack of three there, just in case you, know, you weren't sure. So we're going to use one of these for our experiment. Now, these date from 1967, so that makes them um, 53 years old, 50, yeah, 53 years old, yeah. lovely. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna repeat some of the consumer tests. Now, the main way that these were tested by the London Rubber Company before they reached the consumer was by electronic testing. And um, Justin, I don't suppose you've got one of those images handy, do you? Have you got image number nine handy at all? Can you flash that up for us? Great, so what you should all be seeing now is uh, a young lady who is mounting uh, a Durex condom onto an electronic probe. So that's, uh, uh, that sends an electronic charge through the condom. And if that charge is picked up on the other side, they know it's not safe uh, because latex is a natural insulator and it comes off the production line. Um, thank you, Justin, that was lovely. Um, so that was one way that the London Rubber Company tested their condoms, but, the Consumers Association weren't really happy with that. Now, in the early 1960s, the Consumers Association um, ran their own tests, and these later became the tests which were used for the British standard. Um, and we're going to repeat some of those, Danny. 
<laughs> Let's do it, Jeff. Let's do it. I'm ready. It's good, doesn't it? I mean, it's not going to be scientific, really, but, you know, we'll, we'll give it a go. So I think the first thing we need is for you to um, pick a condom, any condom, number one, number two, number three. What's it going to be? I think it's going to have to be number two, Jess, number two. Number two. Good choice. All right. So this is our original 1967, 53-year-old condom that we are going to use to experiment with. So these are very rare. I, I, I don't want to do this again. <laughs> my heart's in my mouth a little bit here. But um, shall, shall we open it up? Let's, let's do it. Shall we? Yeah. Do you know, Jess, that is the same age as me, that condom. <laughs> Slightly younger than my last boyfriend. Here we go. <laughs> right, so here it is. So here you are, folks. This is an original lubricated Durex Gossamer from 1967. Oh. Um, I think I need I need something to um, unroll this. On. Uh, Jess, I've got something here. Oh yeah. What do you? Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's lovely. Can you pass it over? Yeah, sure. I'll yeah. just. So if I give it back to you. Are you ready? That's great. Okay, great. <laughs> On reflection, I think that's um I think that's a bit lewd, Danny. I think I'm right. gonna give that back to you. <laughs> you <go>. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think I'm gonna use my porridge spoon instead. Fair enough. More family friendly. <laughs> so obviously the first thing we want to do is to have a look at this beastie here. So let's unroll it. Now, the first test that we're going to do is filling this with air. I mean, it's pretty basic, but it, it was a standard way of just quality checking condoms, that they'd be filled with air, and then you could um, put them near your face and see, <laughs> see if anything came out. So here we are. Oops. I've got to say, that's um, for a 53-year-old protective, that's very pliant. <laughs> It's sticking a little bit. <laughs> so um, we need to fill this with air. Now, I don't have any compressed air. What's that you've got there, Danny? Well, actually, just, I'm just going to flash up this uh, quite elderly uh, poster now, but just saying Jess is a professional, so uh, please don't try this with compressed air at home. It can be dangerous. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Safety is very important, of course. Yes. <laughs> now, I don't have any compressed air. All I've got is this balloon pump. That's it. But this is an original London rubber balloon pump. So for members of the audience of a certain age, they will recognise the brand Aerial Balloons. And that was a London rubber brand because they also monopolised the toy balloon business. Little fun fact for you there. Now, I didn't have much luck with this earlier, so I'm going to give it a go, Danny. I don't, I don't think it's going to work. Anything could happen. Anything could happen or not. All right, let's give it a go. Oh, oh there, were, there, was, there were signs of life. <laughs> let's just try it again. It is 53 years old. Wow. Oh, how yeah. hard I pump, it's just not having any effect. So I think I think um I'm think I'm gonna have to use I'm think I'm gonna have to try something else, Danny. All right. Okay. Let's try filling this with air. Oh, it's pretty disgusting, I've got to tell you. It's 53 years old. I think I can look. Oh I, I I'm sorry, Mum. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't look. <laughs> Oh, I'll, I'll give it another puff for good measure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, we're looking good. It's got a good sound. I can't feel any air coming. Can you feel anything coming out of that, Danny? No. No? No, that's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. So that's 53 years old. So, oh, <laughs> that's 
So that's the initial test. That's the air test, pretty standard. But now we're going to go on to something um, a little more sophisticated. So what they used to do after that was they used to do the water test. Now, I don't really want to, I don't really want to get wet, Danny, so I'm just going to prepare myself. Okay, I'm going to pop the phone light. I need to get this on. Wow, yeah. Safety first, safety first. Safety, um, safety first. I've I'm lost sick. my head. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to get myself uh, ready a bit as well, just in case there's any uh, fallout from that experiment. That's a good idea, Danny. That's yeah. a good idea. Yeah, I bet I might get my gloves on as well for this. No? I mean, anything could happen. <laughs> just, I'm actually, I'm flabbergasted that that 53-year-old condom was performing that well. <laughs> well, Danny, there's more to come. Oh. We're not finished yet. Okay. We're not, we're not finished yet. All right. Now, I think to do this, I'm I'm going to have to get my box out, Danny. I don't think there's any other way. I'm going to have to get my box out. Excuse okay. me. There we go. There's Remember my box. People watching. Oh. There's my box. That's lovely. Right. There's the gossamer. Uh, now, um, have you seen my jugs anywhere, Danny? Your jugs? My jug. Oh, there they are. Oh. <laughs> there they are. Um, I think they're a bit small for this, actually. No, I think we'll, we'll be better. We'll be better off with the bottles. We'll be better off with the bottles. Oh. Right. Yeah. I'm just going to prepare myself. Bear with me. <laughs> I've got a lot of electronics around here. Yeah. <laughs> I am starting to have some doubts <laughs> and a few regrets. Right. The things you do for science, Jess, is uh, you're putting yourself out there. Thank you. Yes, let's call it that. Let's call it science. <laughs> right. So here it is. So I'm just going to fill it with a little bit to start off with, and then I'll explain what I'm doing. So I'm going to hold this condom up, and I'm going to put a little bit of water in. It's, it's very slippery. <laughs> very, it's very slippery. I think I might put my hood up. There we go. Right. Are you ready, Danny? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Now we're going to leave. We're going to leave that in there. We're going to let that water and the protective acclimatise to one another for just a moment. Yeah. So in these water tests, there were two phases. So in the first phase. The protective, as we'll call it, was filled with 300 millilitres of water. And I think that's about what I've got here. It's not very much. It's just a small amount. Um, and then it was a very simple matter of waiting for a little while and seeing if any water came out. So the way that this was done is you would take a tissue. I always like to have a box of tissues handy. You know, you never know. Can and, you <laughs> You're right there, Danny. I'm fine. I'm You're fine. good. Yeah, I'm a bit worried myself, but we'll carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so you would wrap a wrap something absorbent around it. Can you see any wet patches there? I can see a dry as a bone. It's a it's a dry as a bone that tissue. There we are. So the first test was just to have the 300 mil. Now, these had to be artificially aged when they did the testing. So they would pop them in the oven at 70 degrees for seven days. <laughs> but luckily, ours is already 53 years old, so we don't have to worry about that. So what we're going to do now is test for strength. So this test with the 300 ml of water just tested for holes. Now we're testing for strength. I'm a bit worried about this bit. <laughs> Is this where it could go slightly wrong? It, it could go really badly wrong. And I've got my rain mac on, but it, it could go wrong. So the standard test was about five pints of water. And that was, yes, five pints. And that was to test the strength. So here we go. We're going to do it. We're going to start with a two pint bottle, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit worried, but I'm going to carry on. All right. Oh. 
Oh, getting that's just spillage from the top. <laughs> the vessel is still intact. Excellent. All right. I'm going to keep going. There is going to be some spillage, which is why I've got this litter tray here. Let's keep going. Oh, might need a little, might need a little bit of help. A little bit of help. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think the elasticity might have gone. Let's give it another try. Oh, let's give it another try. Yeah. So I think what we're going to do is we're just going to allow that to stretch just for a moment there, Danny. Let's uh, let's take our time, Jess. Let's, let's not take it. our time. Let's take our time because we've got four pints to go. <laughs> Sell yourself in, folks, just to see how long this can go. Get comfortable. <laughs> Get comfortable. It could take a while. So in order to prepare for this, Danny, I had to cover the whole of my lovely pine table with cling film. Yes. Protective practices, Jess. Well, yes, protective practices, which is also the title of my book. So let's go on. Let's try. Let's try again. Oh. I'm going to give it another go, Danny. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Yeah. That's <laughs> quite heavy now, Jess. I'm imagining. It is getting pretty heavy. I've got to say, it's getting pretty heavy. Oh, there we go. We're getting a little bit of stretch on it now. <laughs> oh, 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 there it goes. Wow. All right, it's happening. It's happening. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How do we think, Jess? Oh, Daddy, I can't look. I can't look. Right. Are we that, at the edge? That two pints. What about you, Jess? I'm getting quite sweaty here now. It often happens. <laughs> Will I give it a little lift? No. Whoa. That's two pints. That's two pints, Danny. Shall I go on? If you dare, yes, if you dare. They did use to test it with five. Yeah, all right, okay. I've got my pink bottle. All right, here we go. Are you ready? ready. Two more pints. <sighs> I really am starting to have regrets, Danny. <laughs> right, here we go. That's about three pints. Wow. 53 years old, this is. 53 My years word. old. <laughs> <laughs> it looks obscene. It really does. Right, here we go. Right, okay. Oh my God. That's, that's, four, that's four pints. I'm, I'm going to give it a little lift. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's four, that's four pints. Wow. That's four pints. Are we ready for the last pint? <laughs> I can't bear it. <laughs> I can't bear it, Tammy. I want to go home. I don't want to play this game anymore. <laughs> I, think, I think we're going to need a drum roll. I think we're going to yeah, need a drum yeah. roll for the final pint. Okay. Jess, I happen to have a drum here, but I know we've got some you stuff. Don't, there. Danny, you don't have a drum there. I'm ready. Okay, here we go. All right. I'm going to start. Okay. Ah, there we go. 
Yes! Look at that! That's 53 years old. Wow. As good as the day it was made. <laughs> That's pleasingly wobbly. Wow. <laughs> I think I've got a tie knot in that, Danny. That's the best thing, isn't it? It's, yeah. Tie knot in it and get rid of it. Yeah. yeah. So there we are. So their claim. Oh my. Oh, I was just. Oh. Oh, it, oh it's, it's sprung a leak. <laughs> It's, it has now sprung a leak because I've mishandled it. <laughs> I think uh, I think it's a very very good product. So, Danny, I'm going to cut away for a second while I put this away. Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely fine. I'll all right. I'll see you in a minute. I think we need just need a second uh, here just to um, process that. I am genuinely pleased that something that's made of rubber has lasted. I know it's in the foil and I know it's um, it's kind of sealed, but uh, heavens above, I mean, elastic bands uh, don't last that long. And, you know, elastic bands gone. It's it's brittle. It just snaps. I'm genuinely gobsmacked that it uh, it took five pints there. And I'm also really impressed at the level of, um, I suppose, like strength testing of something like that as well. It's not just uh, like a pint, five pints. <laughs> it's like, it would be more than you'd ever really need, isn't it really, in the under the circumstances. So it kind of brings us on to um, ideas about, you know, um, quality products, I suppose, having faith, having, having trust in a brand like that. But I mean, you know, if there's one British brand, I think that a lot of people have, <laughs> I say our generation um, are probably familiar with, uh, it's Durex. Well, it's a very reliable product. <laughs> and I don't receive any money from the company whatsoever. <laughs> well, thank you for sitting through that nerve wracking experiment with me. I I've got to say, Danny, I I it could have gone either way. I was a bit worried. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm genuinely surprised. I honestly thought, I thought we're going to have to switch to something much newer. <laughs> wow. I could just, if I may, what kind of lubricant did they use in the in the foil um, sealant when they were part of the process? Uh, well, actually, they had their own lubricant, which was a powder lubricant called Sensitol. Um, and they, the video that we saw earlier, I don't know if you remember it, but it showed the condom going through the process. It's a fully automatic process. And what they did was they adapted that. So right at the end, a little squirt of it went onto every single one before it went into the foiling machines. Um, so it was it was really very innovative at the time. Thank you. And um, I suppose, you know, you, you talked about dryness. Um I suppose when you're dealing with something um, that, that's, let's face it, uh, you know, comes into contact with sensitive parts, um, sensitivity is going to be an issue, uh, isn't it? And I think that's obviously the the big selling point. I suppose that's the unique um, quality of the of the Gossamer uh, condom. Um, before we get to uh, some of the questions that uh, have come in um, via our, our viewers out there, um, Jess, this is um, really is a, a fascinating book, if I can say. Um, it's genuinely a labour of love. I can see how much work um, has got into it. And I'm sure, um, you know, our, our viewers would be interested in really how did you how did you come to this uh, particular topic? What 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 was it appealed to you? Well, I mean, it's something I get asked quite a lot. Um, and actually, it came to me at the welcome. So I was doing some research at the welcome in the archives. Um, and I was actually looking at the pill. Um, so I was I was looking at something that you would think is quite different. Um, and I was looking through these lovely 1960s um, medical advertisements that you hold there at the welcome. Um, so I was looking through these and getting to know all the different brands. And the London Rubber Company kept popping up. Um, and I knew what they made. And I, I thought, well, why? 
why do they keep popping up in my research on the pill? And actually, they made their own pill, and that's what drew me in. I just I had to find out what was what was going on with that company at that time in the sixties. Um, so it was a real um, it was a bit of a detective story. There's a lot of detective work to be done, um, but I'm, I was just hooked. I was just hooked, and what I discovered um, was a really um, innovative company who was always coming up with new ideas and who was always trying to squash and undercut their competitors and not always in the best way <laughs> um but uh, yeah i was just hooked on the story who wouldn't be who's not interested in that sort of thing danny i ask you <laughs> thank you now <clears throat> i was uh, uh before we get on to the sort of uh, the 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 sort of business side of things I love facts that are really obscure, and this is a bit of a kind of bit of a quiz on your own book here. But um, you mentioned, yeah, they had a, a, a pill that they they looked into, um, and I found a lovely um, a fact there about how they how they differed in terms of where they got the the source material from. Do you know what I'm getting at? I are you are you talking? About no, I don't know what you're going to, no. <laughs> I'm going to put it out there, yams. You're talking about the yam, the Barbasco yam, the Barbasco yam, which grows wild in Mexico. There is a lovely picture of the yam um, in the book. Um, and yes, uh, there was a substance that, that was extracted through this yam, uh, which um, was used to make a synthetic uh, progesterone. And that's what was used to make the, the first pill. I mean, it's marvellous. You've got everything in this story, haven't you? You've got rubber, you've got yams. It's fantastic. Yep. Um, I think I'll bypass the mayor's urine um, for another time. <laughs> <laughs> but your, what I found fascinating is it is one of those stories that is really interesting on a number of levels in terms of the sort of changes of, of, of attitudes to sexuality in Britain, particularly post-war and into the 60s when there were huge um, uh, cultural shifts and you also mentioned things like the Family Planning Association and it's clear that a company that's kind of in the shadows like the London Rubber Company has to tread a sort of delicate path and almost like a bit of a dance with some of these other authorities and bodies in how it promotes itself uh, it was extremely profitable, wasn't it? But it had to be a little bit careful, I guess. Well, um, yes and no. I mean, the Family Planning Association, and of course, the Welcome holds the archives of the Family Planning Association, um, which I used extensively in my work. Um, they were a fairly powerful organisation and they made themselves um, the go-to media-friendly source of information on anything to do with contraception in the 50s and 60s. So really, if you wanted to promote your product and you couldn't do it through normal advertising channels, which was difficult for condoms, then you needed the Family Planning Association to be on your side. But it was a bit of a tug of war. And um, John Harvey, who you saw in the interview earlier, um, he had quite a bit to say about that when I interviewed him a couple of years ago, and that's that's all in the book as well. Um, but it's very characteristic of the London Rubber Company. You know, they they trod some on some very thin ice. Mm. They undertook some very difficult schemes, but at the same time, they were very successful and very quietly confident and. The most important thing is the confidence they had in the products that they were producing. Uh, and I think we've seen some very good evidence today that that confidence is well founded. Uh, yes, it's um, I suppose it's the there's also, as you kind of hinted at, there's almost like a sort of um, there's a there's a there's like a national kind of um, association with something like. Um, you know contraception and, and standards it's about safety after all and I think if anything the British culture has got quite a focus on health and safety <laughs> if you do take it seriously um, uh, if I may I've got one one little anecdote um, because you mentioned in the there's some there's some wonderful stories in the book about um, you know the kind of uh, 
was it embarrassment? Um, you know, was it more practical purposes about keeping things, you know, under the counter? Um, uh, you know, phrases like any something for the weekend, sir, at barbers shops where male, uh, you know, male only people would uh, would be. Um, my uh, my dear old mum uh, actually was um, behind the counter in Boots Chemist um, in a small town in Kent. And she just left school. And you can imagine the uh, lack of sex education um, in the sort of, uh, uh, schools in the in the uh, late 40s. And um, she uh, she was behind the counter at Boots. She was 14 and a gentleman came in and asked for did they sell Durex? Uh, and my mum just just kept saying, what, sorry, <laughs> what? What, what? And of course, he, he was getting slightly more exasperated. Um, then she had to be taken aside and told that they were contraceptives. And eventually she had to ask her older sister what was a contraceptive. So you can kind of illustrate how it really wasn't sort of taught. It wasn't out in the open like it is these days. I, th I think that's a really sweet story. And, you know, Boots actually wouldn't sell Durex for a long time. I don't think it was till about 65 that they agreed to stock Durex. And it was for exactly that reason. They didn't. They had lots of young girls working on the counter and they didn't want them to get into this sort of difficulty. But um, during the war, it was 14-year-old girls who were on the production line at Chingford who were producing condoms. So I think it's six of one and half a dozen of another. Um, there's certainly people that I, I have spoken to in the course of the book who were working at the company and didn't know what they made until they were a few days in, which is, which is really sweet, isn't it? It's really sweet. I, I love it that it's just a local place with just, you know, people doing the sort of factory production, popping them on the, the machines there, as a matter of fact, isn't it? It's very down to earth. Um, right, thank you for indulging me. We have got questions coming in, Jess, if that's Ooh. okay. And this is a nice one here. Um, where does the word condom uh, come from? Um, protective or um, preservative makes sense, um, but uh, condom isn't an obvious word. Um, I'm not sure myself. Any any ideas? Well, there's been a fair bit written about this, and I, I'm not sure that any of it's conclusive, but the story I stick with is that there was a Colonel Condom, Condom, <laughs> C-U-N-D-U-M or something like that, um, and that's where it came from. I mean, to be honest... I don't know conclusively where where that name comes from, um, but there's there's plenty of writing about it. But the stories are all pretty much the same. That it was a name taken from a person who supplied them, um, and of course, um, you know th these products have been around for a very very long time in one shape or another. Well, <laughs> usually the same shape. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, unless they're anatomically uh, designed. Uh, that we've... happened in the seventies. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we, we've great. We've got some more, more questions coming in. I know one um, from earlier. Um, we're getting some very nice feedback from this. Uh, I think um, the one I was also interested in um, because it it goes into something slightly slightly different, but um, obviously. The London Rubber Company has a, there is a sort of colonial link there, isn't there? Mm. Latex production and the kind of infrastructure, I guess, that was, they could tap into. Would that be fair to say? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, if, if you're looking at companies in, in this period who are using materials that come from what was then the empire, um, then, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, that's, that's you know, part of what colonialism did it supplied goods and materials um, for industry that would benefit British businesses and the London Rubber Company was no different so their rubber uh, their latex came from Malaysia or Malaya as it was called back in um, 1920s 1930s um, which was very common um, and that was where Britain's big rubber plantations were in America of course they were they were in Brazil but those plantations were getting quite old by the 30s, whereas the Malay, Malayan ones or Malaysian ones were were reaching maturity. Um, so London rubber, yeah, def it def definitely benefited um, from um, the many, many different plantations. And I think mainly it was the Dunlop plantation. It's something I haven't looked into a great deal, 
Um, unfortunately, one has to restrict oneself with these things because there's so many paths you could go down. Yeah. But I would certainly encourage anyone who wanted to, to pursue that. I think it would be a great line of inquiry. Thank you. We're getting some really lovely comments. Can I thank everybody for your, your lovely feedback um, this evening? Um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been our first. I, I've certainly really enjoyed it. Um, if I may, just just time for one um, here. Did London Rubber ever make femidons um, or have a role in creating or marketing these? Oh, now that's a good question. I'm not sure if they were involved in the femidon. Um, I think that was a different company. However, London Rubber historically had produced lots of different types of women's contraceptives and experimented in them. So in the 30s and 40s, they were making caps and diaphragms which fit over the cervix. And they were really, they were really doing that as a competitive strategy to sort of squash their competitors and sneak condoms in. Um, but they, they were making female contraceptives. They made a pill which lasted for about 10 years before it disappeared without a trace. Um, they experimented with some intravaginal rings in the 70s. I don't think they went anywhere. So, so far as the Femidom is concerned, off the top of my head, I don't think they had anything to do with it, but they always had an eye on the women's market, always. And, you know, they, they did come up with some good products for women. Yes. Um, I think one of the things, obviously, at Welcome, we, we have um, some interesting material about contraception generally. And obviously, there are some kind of uh, side effects and potential health issues with things like, um, you know, uh, pills, uh, taking them. But I think you've you've demonstrated today that really, I mean, gosh, um, that uh, really simple thing. Where did that come from, Danny? I just just happened to have one uh, lying around. That, <laughs> don't take that the wrong way. Um, but it hasn't changed, has it, in, in such a long time? Um, and I think in these days when we're all very conscious about touch and um, protection, um, it's it's kind of it's kind of a nice time to be you know going back to um, good old fashioned uh, you know barrier uh, protection and sparing a another thought for the the humble um, the humble condom. Um, Jess, we're kind of just about running out of time, but I did want to say thank you so much. Um, uh, it has been a real treat. I know people have really enjoyed it. Um, I, I was genuinely on the edge of my seat at that, that condom experiment. And uh, this has been a, this is such a meticulously researched and genuinely interesting and wide ranging book. So I do recommend anyone who's interested um, in taking this further more seriously. Uh, have a look um, at Jess's book. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to thank, um, while we've got time, the AV team for making this possible. It's not been, uh, it looks uh, wonderfully smooth, but there's been an awful lot of hard work uh, behind the scenes. Um, and this was our first time. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Jess, uh, thank you very much indeed um, for a delightful presentation. And uh, I hope we can do something um, again in future. I'd like that very much and my sincere thanks to everybody at the welcome, yourself and Justin and Thea and everyone else who's backstage and also Leslie who wrote the foreword for the book. Um, I couldn't have done any of this without the support that I've received from the welcome and that all started with Ross McFarlane about seven years ago. Um, and uh, Phoebe Harkins as well, I mean, and, and Angela Sandwood. There's so many. <laughs> oh, it's like an awards night, Danny. <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody. <laughs> but thank you to everyone at, at Welcome. You've really helped me to bring this project together and I hope we've managed to have a bit of fun tonight. I, I certainly have. That's, good. <laughs> that's going to be some pretty wild dreams tonight as well, I think, to be honest. That's, it's gone into my subconscious. Don't blame me. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us for our, our first excursion um, online. Um, thanks again to Jessica. Uh, please do um, continue with any, any feedback. We'd love to hear your, your thoughts. But thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. And uh, when we have another ready, we will uh, let you know. So for now, from uh, uh, me here in, in my boudoir in, uh, in Kent, <laughs> uh, Jessica's kitchen, uh, thank you to the AV team again. And uh, we hopefully will see you 
in the future. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>